The Bible insists your body is a gift from God. You don't have a spare in the trunk, so take very good care of that body right there. It's a gift from God. But if you are wanting to relieve yourself of depression by just living high, watch out. Be very careful. Because that body that you have is a gift from God, handle with care. That is why in the second, third, and fourth centuries, followers of Jesus Christ built something that had never been built before. You know what it was? A hospital. Followers of Christ began hospitals. Why? What did Jesus do when he met sick people? Healed them. Exactly. And so if I'm a follower of Christ, I understand this body is a gift from God, and if you're sick, I need to use my rational mind to do good medicine and bring healing as fast as I can to your life. So when we talk about the deity of Christ, I've heard people say that it's incorrect to call him the father or the, uh, you know, because I believe, I believe they're all one, you know what I'm saying? But I know in 14, in John 14 and 15, we see that uh, Jesus says, my, the Father will send the helper. Then right after he says, I will send the helper. So I'm wondering, is it, is, it a, is it wrong to say that Jesus is as well as the Father? Because some people say, no, the Son is not the Father and the Holy Spirit isn't the Son. It's not the same. But I, I kind of look at it as it's all one because it's only one God. But some people will say they're all different persons, but they're all still one. So I was just wondering in terms of that, is, is it okay to call Jesus the Father? And the Son is God emptying himself, humbling himself, and becoming a human being. And wow, that makes all the difference. Why? Because it means God isn't just a cosmic muscle flexing in outer space. God is a suffering God who humbled himself by becoming a baby by living a sinless life, and then by giving his life on a cross for you and for me. Wow, I can approach this God. This God is highly approachable. He's very personal. He's very humble. He's a suffering God. And that is one of the main reasons I've seen why people who are suffering find Jesus Christ so attractive. If there's evidence behind the Christian faith, we better understand why in the world the Bible calls God Father and a person, not just an it, a person that we can really get to know. And understanding that it's a person that has an actual name, Yahweh, Jehovah, understanding that means we can get in a relationship with God. So that, that's crucial. Don't fall into the politically correct culture, which just says, well, we don't want to name somebody. We definitely don't want to name God. But by doing so, you're disrespecting the God of the entire universe. And so, I mean, how limiting is that? How, how it, it's just, it's a ridiculous train of thought. And if we start to lose our understanding of, of respecting someone like that, especially God, I mean, how are we going to respect each other? Personally, I struggle with, like, judging. I know you're supposed to judge righteously, but I don't really, I try to understand how to judge righteously. But then I look at myself and then I say like I, I curse and then I tell someone else not to curse. Yeah. How can I find myself when I'm still a sinner at times? How can yep. I find myself to like judge this person righteously and preach to them right <clears throat> instead of like being a hypocrite? Yep, you bet. I've met one student in 40 years of speaking on university campuses who claimed that to be morally perfect. He was a student at MIT. And when he said, I'm morally perfect, all of his classmates burst into laughter. All right, so you and I got a problem, as does that guy at MIT. We all are sinners. Jesus' analysis of the human dilemma is correct. Now, here's one of the reasons I believe in Jesus. Jesus points out, you are magnificent. You're a human being created in the image of God. And you're wretched. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, guess what? I'm just like you. You and I are mixed up kids. We are capable of incredible goodness and we are capable of incredible wretchedness. And the proof of that is I do not want you to know all of my motives. I do not want you to know all of my fantasies. I would be horribly embarrassed for you to know all of my 
fantasies, all of my motives. All right, so now what are we supposed to do? First of all, we're to repent. Now, what does that mean? It means I, am resp I take responsibility for my wretchedness. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame my culture. I don't blame my genetics. I take responsibility. And I say, I have chosen to do wrong. I have lusted. I've been greedy. I've been proud. I've had subtle racist attitudes. And that is wrong. And I need to repent. I need to ask people to forgive me for the wrong I've done. And I need to ask God to forgive me. Oh, Cliff, that shows what a wretched, low, poor self-image you have. Baloney. It's a sign that I have a very high self-image because it means I know that I am responsible for what I've done. I'm taking responsibility. Secondly, I know that I can be a better person with God's help, and I need His Holy Spirit to make me into a better person. You see, sir, repentance is incredibly healthy because repentance is like you being in high school saying, I'm not the smartest sharpest pencil in the stack. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to develop my mind. I want to get better. Well, that's what, what repentance is, except in the moral, ethical realm. I want to be a better person, so I repent. I ask God for forgiveness, and I take responsibility. Secondly, I put my faith in Christ and say, Jesus, I need your grace. I need your help to change, to become the better person that I know I should be. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me from the inside out. And that's why i got to find a church where I can worship Christ with other people who will encourage me, but who also will hold me accountable for what I'm doing with my life. And i got to work. Why? Because a lazy person is saying, God, you've not given me anything of any significance. That's a lie. God has given you gifts and me gifts, and we are to work and use them to serve. In other words, I have found in my life, your name is? Clay. Clay, Cliff. All right, Clay, I have found in my life that when I repent and then start doing, not just praying, not just thinking, but doing what I know is right, that is a key way that God changes me through that action of replacing the wrong that I've done with what he calls me to do that's good. If we could take advantage of you being vulnerable for a second, and maybe you give us one or two of your vulnerabilities. But it sounded like one of them was at the very end of your question, which is when it comes to sharing faith, perhaps. Okay, just two very, very simple ones, because I get this one a lot. One would be share your own struggles first. Share the struggles of how many Christians you know who deal with similar ones. And then secondly, very close to the first, is talk about your doubts. We all have doubts, if we're honest. And if you're a Christian and you don't have doubts, I'm doubting your Christian faith, personally. Because every single leader since the beginning of the early church had doubts. David endlessly had doubts. Peter denied Christ to a seven-year-old girl three times. I mean, talk about doubts. He was with him. He was his best friend his entire life. Well, entire ministry. So those are two areas. Keep it very simple, but share that because, yes, more and more of the evolutionary psychologists are showing that every single human being is born with something called self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. And biblical understanding of self-righteousness makes way more sense because we all hate it. And the Bible says it is a really bad thing. Who's, who's despised the most in the Bible? It's the Pharisees often. How were they marked as? What were they marked as? The self righteous ones. If you don't believe in God and you simply go by evolutionary theory explaining self-righteousness, why is self-righteousness that bad? It's not that bad. You, know, you could kind of concoct a way of thinking, well, from an evolutionary perspective, if you're self-righteous, you know, maybe you're not really helping your tribe. Come on, give me a freaking break. No, we know self-righteousness is a horrible thing. It totally stinks. You never want to be around a self-righteous, judgmental person. And we all struggle with it. Again, but how are you going to make sense of it? And so sharing your faith, don't preach at somebody. And yet, it's interesting how, despite us being out here doing some preaching, it's interesting how Christians now are the least preachy out of everybody. Why is it that everybody else is preaching but Christians? So don't fall prey just into saying, here are my vulnerabilities, here are my doubts, here are my struggles. Also give them the truth, but that's going to come later on if they're viewing you as perhaps you know, a self-righteous Christian. What do you say to agnostics, like people who are agnostic? Yeah. What do you think about that? 
An agnostic, though, for me, when I encounter them, can oftentimes slip into the dangerous thinking of worshiping the search. I'm just going to worship the search my whole life. And what that is saying is basically, you see the sunset later today. You're running after the sunset. Every time you run after it, it just recedes and recedes and recedes. And I'm never going to get to any type of truth. And so an agnostic one time said to me, he said, you've sold out. You've sold out into a faith belief or any type of system. He even says an atheist is sold out. He said, everybody should say, I have no idea their entire life, what this life is about, or if there's any metaphysical, or if it's all material or immaterial. So they might not actually be searching for something. Yep. They just believe, they just believe there is something. Right. And they just live their lives like anybody else. You know what I mean? Yes. He likes to, I like this illustration. We're all agnostics until right about now. And then you have to decide, is this fist going to hit your face or not? And so starting with that, we, we know we're not fully agnostic. But the person that you're talking perhaps about, I don't know, is on this college campus who doesn't think about ultimate truths or who doesn't think about anything spiritual or, or atheistic, whatever it might be. If they're getting up in, their, in the morning, tying their shoes and going to class, they're living for something or someone. And so everybody out here is living for something or someone. And if you're, say, on the runway as a Victoria's Secret model when it's Fashion Week in New York City, I have my, my professor counseled all those Victoria's Secret models, or the majority of them, because they all had identity issues. And they were all living to look a certain way. And so many of them were jumping off buildings even in New York City. When I say many, it's a handful. Jumped off buildings over the last decade in New York City. Because they're living, many of them have not thought out, just like many people, like you're saying perfectly, Many have not thought out, why am I here? Is there meaning to life? And where am I going? Those are the basic questions of life that every person needs to think of. Instead, they've just been sucked into the purpose of life is for me to look beautiful on the outside. And there's no real me in there. And if I don't look beautiful enough, I'm not going to be accepted. And I'm not going to be able to have a career. And so even that is living for something. Do you believe that God sees sin as, as all yeah. equal? Meaning... Does he view rape as the same as stealing an apple? Because we, I have some people in my life say all sin is equal and God sees the exact same, but how does God feel, where is his heart towards rape or stealing an apple? Is there a difference there in God's eyes? All sin is the same in the sense that all sin separates me from God. That's why I and the murderer both need Christ just as deeply, because we both have sinned. So all sin is the same in that all sin separates me from Christ. But secondly, no, all sin is not the same in its consequences. It is far worse for me to murder him than it is for me to hate him. It's far worse for me to rape than to lust in its consequences. So yes, there is a difference between sin. No, there's not a difference in sin in that all sin separates me from God, be I lusting or raping, be I hating or murdering. I'm reading through the Bible and the Good. Old Testament and the New Testament are both very different. Like God has the old covenant and stuff. So like the yes. Israelites have to follow yeah. a certain set of laws. Yeah. And for me, it just feels like really uh, weird to consolidate that. Like that's the same God that's in the New Testament. Like it's a very different set of rules. It's like, why does God not apply the same rules that he has in the New Covenant to how they are in like the Old Testament? You know? You want to answer it, Stuart? <laughs> <laughs> a big part of that is because in the Old Testament, you don't just have the Israelites. You have every civilization trying to prove itself and trying to live holy lives, which is basically just as righteous as possible. Tons of guilt and shame every time they would mess up. And that was across the board. And so there would be blood sacrifice for just about every civilization, not just the Israelites. Oftentimes it was with a goat, right? We get Abraham and Isaac would be an example. Thank heaven that didn't go through. And then you get in the New Testament, Jesus Christ being that ultimate sacrifice because nobody can cleanse themselves, period. And so there was such obsessiveness with the Levites, the priests, everyone trying to cleanse themselves in the Old Testament, but they couldn't do it and they knew they couldn't. And so Christ comes along in the new and now you have the ultimate sacrifice that will clean the slate, take away our guilt and shame. But how interesting because 
So many students here on this campus, the anxiety, the depression, the, the self-loathing, the, the just extended amounts of stress, a lot of that is connected to guilt and shame, and they just don't realize it. It's in different forms. And so we struggle just like those in the Old Testament are struggling, and that's why we need a Savior to actually come and cleanse the slate, give us the Holy Spirit, so we don't have to live through this type of guilt and shame. Come back at like why doesn't God do that like thing where He has Jesus die for our sins? Why doesn't He do it like way before? Why did we have to go through that first set of rules in the first place? You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, as the Israelites who didn't want to live in a theocratic society anymore, it, God was leading them, and they demanded from God. And at first, God wasn't going to give it to them, but eventually, He said, "No." By His own grace and love, He gives us King Saul. And all right, rewind the script even further. The Garden, perfect relationship with God. We decide to go our own way. What happens? No longer are we walking in the cool of the day, Adam and Eve, which means now we are ripped away from the relationship, perfect relationship of God, and we have, that means anxiety comes into play. Stress comes into play. Breakdown comes into play. So you're right. You could have backed the cross all the way back up to the moment Adam and Eve sinned. Now Jesus Christ comes and dies on the cross for us. Now that just would have been Adam and Eve. So in terms of the timing, we don't know exactly why the timing was when it was, but in many ways it makes a lot of sense because all of a sudden the known world really started there in the Roman Empire and began to spread. And the trade routes just started. Literacy really just started. And so it's fascinating. Jesus did come at the right time, if you think of it historically, and yet ultimately you don't know why he did when he did. Okay. The Pharisees come up to Jesus and they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus goes back to Genesis 2.24. Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. But then the Pharisees have a fascinating question. Why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now here's the key. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Going back to Genesis 1 and 2. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. So, much of the Old Testament law is put there by God through Moses because of the hardness of people's hearts. That applies to polygamy. It applies to slavery. Is God for polygamy? Never. But he gives instructions on how polygamy is to be limited in the Old Testament. Is God for slavery? No. But he does give instructions that begin to limit slavery, but don't wipe it all out because of the hardness of their hearts. Is God against divorce? Yes, Malachi, I hate divorce. But due to the hardness of people's hearts, at times, unfortunately, divorce is the best option. Sad, but true. But that is not the way God intended it. Slavery, polygamy, or divorce. Now, what he's doing in the Old Testament is God is calling the Jewish people out to be separate from all the cultures around them. And every culture around Israel celebrated homosexuality, bisexuality, and bestiality. Julius Caesar was every man's man and every woman's man. The Greeks celebrated pedophilia. The Egyptians celebrated homosexuality. The Canaanites practiced bestiality, sex with animals. So every culture around Israel is doing some pretty horrific sexual things. And God is calling the Israelites to be radically different. Now, if it took a civil war to put a major dent in slavery in the United States, you should understand how difficult it is to change culture. 
And so what you have in the Old Testament is you have a tremendous example of how God is changing culture, calling the Hebrew people to be different. And there are a lot of weird stuff in Leviticus. Don't cook a baby goat. Exactly. You got it. You read that, right? Yeah, it was weird. Isn't that weird? And that's why you got to study culture. Because what obviously was happening was, in many of the cultures there, animals were being abused. And the idea of taking a goat's, a mother goat's milk, boiling it, and then putting the baby goat in there to kill it, that's kind of weird. That's sort of denigrating animal life. And so God says, don't do it. Another example would be, don't touch a pigskin. Oh, so God's against football, right? No, it's not the point. God's against football, a pigskin of football. No. But once again, it's addressing a cultural abuse of animal life. So you've got to do a lot of studying when you get into this stuff because it's difficult. It's, our, it's old, really old, and it's radically different from what Jesus is teaching, but the point is God is calling these people out to be different. I just want to know your thoughts and why Christians just feel the need to come and be like, hey, follow God, or, you know, this and this and this is going to happen, you bet. and not other religions. Good. Because I love you, and I love every person here. I don't have an option. I don't love you because I'm a great guy. I love you because Jesus Christ commands his followers to love everybody. And I'm a follower of Christ. And I've experienced his love, and therefore I'm going to do something as stupid as stand out here. And I can promise you, ma'am, my culture where I grew up in Connecticut, you don't do this. Nobody else does it. Okay? So then why would I do this? Something as stupid as stand out here. Because I love you. Which means I really care about your eternal destiny and your life now. And I am convinced to the root of my life, to the root of my being, that your life will be better if you believe in Christ. It'll be better in this life, and I'm convinced if you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. And I want to get to know you for eternity in heaven. That would be an honor for me. I'm also a thinking human being, as you are, which means we're both concerned about truth. I don't want to live for a lie, and I don't want you to live for a lie. I assume that we're here at university because we're all are concerned about truth, growing in education. Jesus said, I am the truth. So for me as a follower of Christ, truth is all wrapped up in a person, Jesus Christ. Okay, now am I making any sense so far? Do you have a problem with anything I've said? I think you're sharing your opinions, and that's what the horse statues are all for. Good. Okay, so you, you go back to the truth issue. And I'm convinced that a liberal arts education is all about the free exchange of ideas, especially when we don't agree. But we respect each other, we're tolerant, but we seek to get going on finding truth. And ma'am, to be honest with you, if I am a breast cancer specialist, and I'm sitting across the table from a woman who's not very well educated, has never had a mammogram, and she has some signs of breast cancer, if I love her, I will tell her about a mammogram. And I will encourage her to get a mammogram. But if I don't love her, I could care less what happens to her breast cancer. Live your own life. Goodbye. You see, that's apathy. In fact, I think that's denigrating a person. No, if I'm a breast cancer specialist, and I'm confronted by a woman who's uneducated, knows nothing about breast cancer, I better tell her about mammogram and the importance of her getting one. Similarly, if Jesus Christ leads to eternal life, I had better tell you about him if I love you, if I'm concerned about truth. Does that make any sense? What do you think about Jesus? Uh, I mean, I grew up, uh, I, I was raised Catholic. I think that people can believe what they want to believe. I, for one, don't really know whether or not God exists, and I honestly couldn't give a Why? I just don't want to waste my life on something that I won't know exists until I die. 
Huh? You know, I don't know his name. Never met the guy before. So you know, bud, just get lost. I want to live my life, you live your life. I can go about life that way, and I think a lot of us have gone about life that way. But wait a second, time out. If this is a human being with innate value, if we are equal, would it not be wise for me to make some effort to get to know him if I have the opportunity? Sure. Well, yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to live a pretty lonely existence. Because every relationship that I have demands effort. And I dare say that every relationship you have demands effort. Effort like love. Effort like forgiving. Effort like telling the truth when you would prefer to lie. Effort like accepting a person for who they are and not forcing them to be someone they're not. Right? Well, I think the same thing might apply between God and me. If he really gave me life, hadn't I better make an effort to get to know him? If you want to, that's up to you. Free will and all that. Yes, free will and all that. Free will and all of that. Pop! Was that a wise decision I made, to hit him? It's free will. It's up to you if it's wise. It's up to me whether it's wise. Your opinions. Okay. Have you ever experienced some opinions that were wrong? If I believe they're wrong, then they're wrong to me. But if other people think they're correct, um, agree to disagree, I guess. Okay, do you really believe that? Okay, so if I have a racist attitude towards this man right here, can you come here a second? If I have a racist attitude towards him, and you ask me, why do you have a racist attitude towards him? And I say, it's my choice. What do you think about that? It's totally your choice. I mean, it's not like a good thing to be a racist person, but if you want to be like that, you can be like that. Okay, but you what did, you did make a judgment there, and I'm glad you did. You said, if you think it's a good thing to be racist. Okay, do you think it's a good thing for me to be racist? No. No. Why? Because it's the 21st century. Oh. So because it's the 21st century, it's not good for me to be racist towards him. Are you serious? What happens if culture changes? What happens if culture says, 25 years from now, racism is good? It's never good. Oh, it's never good. Duh. Good. Why is it never good? Because they're a human being. Because they're a human being. But if this man is simply a cockroach evolved to a higher order, I step on cockroaches. Is there something wrong for me, me stepping on him? So go ahead and try it. I don't think you could step on him. Well, I agree with that. No, no question. He's got a lot more muscle than I do. But... If I could, if I had the strength to do that to him, do you think that's ever right? It's your opinion. Oh, come on, ma'am, you know better than that. Just because it's my opinion that he's inferior to me doesn't make it right, does it? I mean, people are allowed to believe what they want to believe. I know I don't people think are. That's right, specifically, but it's up to you. Okay, but wait a second choices you can craft your own opinions yes correct we can all make our own decisions we can all craft our own opinions but if it is true that this man is created in the image of God that God has given him value and he's created us equal then it is absolutely evil for me to denigrate him so that's why according to Christ it is never permissible for me to denigrate him to dehumanize him because when I do that, I'm saying, not valuable, not valuable, dirt, not valuable. And Christ says, that's a lie. He is valuable, just as valuable as you are, Cliff, because I made you both in my image. And I love you both, and I died for you both on a cross to forgive you and to give you eternal life. You see, ma'am, if you take God out of the picture, you're up a creek without a paddle when it comes to explaining to me why denigrating him is wrong. It's just, as you've said so eloquently, and you're right, it's just a choice. If there is no God, it's just a choice. So if today I want to respect him, that's my choice. And if tomorrow I want to disrespect him, that's my choice. You've got to be kidding me. You really want to live your life that way? You think that makes sense with, with reality? That 
doesn't make sense, ma'am. In fact, I think you know that because I don't think that you live out moral relativism. I don't think you live out, oh, it's whatever I choose. So I'm going to flip you off today because I choose to. And I'm going to love you and respect you tomorrow because I choose to. I don't think you live that way, do you? Correct me if I'm wrong. I might be wrong. Well, the world isn't just black and white, so it's, you know, it's, there are shades of gray. There are different things people believe. It's not like a simple, clean-cut thing, whether something is right or wrong. Yeah, I would agree. I don't know how much money I should give to feed the starving. Should I give 90% away or 100? Well, thank you, man, for talking. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.